All right, so. Okay, so I, I open, all right. All right, so as, as folks come on in, I just wanna say hi, thank you for being here. Um, we'll start in a couple of minutes. So if you, if you wanted to go grab a glass of water, stretch your legs, um, get a body break in there, you're more than welcome to. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start at as close to 1.30 as we can. But I just wanna say thanks and thanks so much for everyone who's here. Oh, and um, I forgot to mention, but we do have the chat open for attendees. So if you wanted to introduce yourself to everyone else in the room, um, this is a webinar. So you, unfortunately, attendees can't turn on their mics or um, your, your cameras, but uh, we'd love your interaction. So please feel free to use the chat. So apologies, I'm going to keep repeating myself just as people filter in, but I just want to say hi, thank you so much for being here to everyone who's attending. Um, we'll get started in probably a minute or so, but um, the chat is open to attendees. So if you want to introduce yourself, let us know how you're doing um, and, and feel free to interact with each other. This is a webinar, so unfortunately you cannot turn on your, your camera and mic, but the chat is open to you if you want to say hello. Hi, Alex. Thanks for breaking the ice in the chat. <laughs> it's good to hear from you. Hi, Shannon. So feel free to keep saying hi in the chat. I think that we, in the interest of time, um, we'll get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Becca, who's going to do a quick introduction. Just going to do a quick welcome to everybody um, from the Faculty of Education. Uh, I'm Rebecca Carnival. I work uh, in the Faculty of Ed, um, and I want to start with a quick land acknowledgement uh, before our conversation. I um, want to recognize that Queens is located on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Uh, to acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its long history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It's to acknowledge the territory's significance for the Indigenous people, who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities are tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants. Um, I think that's an especially important thing to do before we start this conversation. We're so grateful uh, for Queen's Reads and for Clarissa de Leon's work to organize this conversation with Amanda Paris today. Um, I also want to note that this is part of the IIE, IIE, IIE series, Indigenization, Inclusion, and Equity, which we started a few years ago uh, to have these conversations uh, to help foster progressive ethical leaders in education. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Clarissa de Leon, who's going to introduce our guest, Amanda Paris. Thanks so much, Becca. So um, before I, I introduce Amanda, I do, I want to take a minute to kind of center myself and maybe center everyone who is in attendance today. Um, I want to acknowledge that this week has been an incredibly hard week for Black folks with um, the, the shooting of Dante Wright and then also the ongoing trial um, of Derek Chauvin. And um, there's, no, there's no way to acknowledge this in a way that isn't painful, but I think it's important to acknowledge it, especially considering that today we are going to be talking about anti-Blackness and in institutions, and we'll be focusing on education because we are doing this event in a faculty of education, but I think it's important to acknowledge that policing is another institution in which there has been lots of violence towards Black folks. And if you are in attendance 
or watching this later and you are a black identifying individual, I'm hoping that the next hour is a space in which you feel validated and affirmed in your experiences, in your grief, in whatever emotion that you're feeling. And um, importantly, I want to address all the non-black folks in the room as well and say that you know this is very much a learning opportunity and i hope that whatever you take from this next hour whatever you learn from this next hour that um, you take it forward with the goal of action um, and so um, whatever action looks like in your life uh, i hope you hold that close to your heart as we move forward so um, i just i felt it was important for us to to um, to speak to that. But um, I do want to turn it over to Amanda now and introduce Amanda, who um, is our special guest today. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Amanda's work, Amanda is actually here today because she is um, the 2020-2021 Queensbreed author or playwright in this case for Other Side of the Game. And um, Amanda is also a writer and host um, for CBC. She works on the exhibitionists, the filmmakers from the vaults and Marvin's Room on CBC Radio. And she also writes a weekly column for CBC Arts. But as I mentioned, um, the big reason that Amanda is joining us um, is because of her work on Other Side of the Game, which is the Queen's Read selection for this year. So hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, today's talk is, um, as Becca mentioned in her introduction, a part of the IIE series, which is looking at how, how can we make more critical educators, how can we think about education more critically in terms of um, justice and anti-oppression and anti-racism. And um, what was interesting for me after reading Other Side of the Game is it wasn't until later on that I found out about your past work as an alternative educator and community organizer. And having found out about your work um, in education um, afterwards, it kind of made me reframe and rethink Other Side of the Game in, in particular ways. And so I, I thought it'd be interesting for us to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and so uh, we, we, can, we can just, get into it. So um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about some of the work that you did previous to writing Other Side of the Game and to working on CBC. And for those of you who don't know, Amanda co-founded and um, facil helped facilitated and directed um, an organization called Lost Lyrics. Um, and this is such an interesting program for me because of the way in which the program is described on the website. It, um, it, it's really beautiful sounding, but also frames and conceptualizes knowledge and education in, in a very particular way. And some of the, the quotes that I pulled from the website that really kind of struck me, um, the first one was, um, you uh, Lost Lyrics is described as a mobile and innovative learning incubator that empowers thousands of young people to create a bridge of knowledge between the streets and the classroom. And the reason why that kind of description um, stuck out to me is because it made me really curious about in your experience as an activist and a community educator and community organizer, what kind of gaps between the knowledge that you develop on the street versus the knowledge that is developed in the classroom kind of exist? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, I would just preface this by saying that Lost Lyrics was an organization that I helped to co-found and worked with for close to a decade, but is no longer in operation. And the work that I did um, was a while ago. So I feel like some of the critiques and the understandings and references that I have might be a bit dated. As a result, I'm not in the education world as much anymore. And so I feel like there have been lots of fascinating, progressive, and interesting conversations that have been sparked in mainstream educational institutions and spaces since I used to work at Lost Lyrics. But, but at the time when we were doing the work that we were doing, it felt like um, not, it felt like the observations that we were making in the communities that we were working in, which were Jane and Finch and Malvern in Toronto, um, was that students were feeling very disengaged from the spaces of learning that they had in the classroom. But when we interacted with them in what was originally an after school program, they were so excited and hungry to learn but they didn't have that same enthusiasm, excitement and hunger in the classroom. And we wanted to know what, what was the gap there. It felt when we talk about, uh, when you talk about that quote from the streets to the classroom, it's a little bit you know, romantic <laughs> in the way that it's phrased, but what we really 
felt was the, the dis distinction between what we were doing and what was happening in the classroom is that we utilized their life experiences and the things that they were going through as the launching pad to explore critical conversations, um, to explore different things that they could learn, to explore um, everything from geography to history to science, like your their experiences were the launching pad for all of it. And so instead of what they were going through every day outside of the classroom being seen as separate, it became instead a critical part of their learning process. It made building curricula something that was um, not static, it was constantly being created all the time. We also did a lot of evaluation with the kids in terms of their uh, interest and their um, their excitement over what we had already done. So we would check in with them be like, was that interesting to you? Was it not? Our initial age range was 11 to 14. So that's sort of like middle school about to go into high school range. And that group of kids, that age range is very honest. They have no filters. They will be like, that was so boring. Do not ever do that again. Or they're like, yeah, yeah, we really like that. So it was really cool starting off in that way um, and to figuring out eventually, you know, these are the sort of, uh, these are the things that are successful. These are the tools that are working. These are the activities that they they find engaging and then, and then going farther with it. Um, I would also say that when we started it, both myself and the other co-founder were undergrads in university. And uh, she, Natasha Daniel, was studying international development. I was studying political science and women and gender studies. And we were feeling like we were learning so many interesting things that we wished we had learned earlier. Um, and so we were bringing a lot of that sort of high level theory into this classroom with middle school students and trying to find ways for them to understand it and engage it with it. And that was so interesting. You know, some there were a lot of fails, but there were also a lot of successes. And we started to realize that, you know, a lot of the stuff that's sort of saved for um, the ivory tower didn't need to be saved. It's things that, you know, these kids could utilize, could understand, could wrap their minds around, and also hopefully utilize it to make their everyday lives more, um, use it in their everyday lives to make those lives more rich, more fulfilling, more, um, and more critically responsive, if that makes sense. Because I think what we observed was a lot of kids felt very powerless to about their circumstances. And so this, you know, insight into why things were the way they were, some tools that they could utilize to engage with the things that were made them feel, I hate the word empowered, um, but made them feel like they had something that they could, they could do. Um, and so interesting to, to hear you describe the process that that went into working with Lost Lyrics and sort of like some of the trial and error and trying to figure out how to, how to form like how to form a program with kids and not just for kids I guess a little bit about a background with me I'm previously a middle school teacher and currently um, I work with an organization in Kingston called Roots and Wings which is for um, black indigenous and POC uh, girls trans and non-binary youth and we do social justice education with them and it's it's very much the same way of like if they are not like vibing with, with something that we're trying, they will let us know. They'll let us know that it's boring. And they'll also let us know when we're talking down to them. And they'll say like, I, I understand what like, you know, a protest is like, or I understand what it means for resistance. And, and um, you know, that idea of, um, you know, bridging whatever gap may exist between the classroom and, and outside the classroom on the streets. It's, it's also a matter of realizing that we often never, like we don't give kids enough credit for what they've already observed, like absorbed or observed. So um, it's interesting to hear some of the parallels and some of, of, uh, of the, the messy parts of trying to do this kind of education. Yeah, it's definitely not smooth. There was, and you know, we started as an after school program. So you also, it's, it's, it's voluntary. So if your program sucks, they're not coming. Like that's the most immediate evaluation, right? If they don't show up, you're going up against basketball programs and dance classes. And you're in, you know, communities where although there's a lot of things that are lacking in Jane and Finch and Malvern, the community centers are popping. There, there's a lot of things happening in those community centers. And so you have competition basically. So we were like, how can we be more interesting than basketball? Like how can we, you know, grab these kids and keep them here, so. Healthy competition. 
Yeah, I, I mean, and uh, it's competition that we've learned to like learn from as well and draw inspiration from. And we take some of the things that we know are working from other community centers and say like, how do we use that as a way to get them interested in some of these social justice topics, which I mean, um, I think is necessary um, for, for any kind of voluntary engagement program. But um, the next question I had kind of, kind of overlaps um, with with things you mentioned in your last answer about you know working with the kids and and trying to really speak to them authentically, um, because another piece that that was mentioned um, that was part of Lost Lyrics and and their foundation was this idea of speaking back to the banking system of education. And for those of you who are maybe not familiar with the terminology, the whole idea of banking in education is something that was developed by Paulo Freire and um, is the idea of like in Western and colonial education, the teacher is often seen as a knowledge holder and the students are just there to receive knowledge. So it's like you're putting things into a bank and then you receive it. And, and I really love this idea of speaking back to it. And I'm wondering, um, what kind of responsibility you see um, educators both inside and outside the classroom to sort of resist that and speak back to it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really, if you decide to engage with that critique, it's a really humbling form of understanding your role in the classroom because, uh, you know, when I was growing up and I was going to school, there was a clear hierarchy in the school system. And it wasn't one that got challenged very often. You know, it's the teacher, as you just very articulately put it, is the holder of all the knowledge and they're depositing it into you. And they might ask a question or two here or there, but mostly the answers they're looking for are a repetition of what they've already given to you, as opposed to anything critical. And so, you know, reading Paulo Freire, uh, reading, you know, people like Ivan Illich and this old idea of de-schooling societies and all this sort of stuff was very influential for us. And we, and especially because we were young, it was easy for us to be like, yeah, we don't actually know anything. <laughs> you know, we are still learning ourselves. And so what does it look like when the space, the classroom becomes an exchange as opposed to, you know, this assumption that we are holding the knowledge, which is why we use the term facilitators as opposed to uh, more than anything else. Like we were just facilitating this, this particular environment and trying to create all of the, create a space that was uh, welcoming, uh, that was designed to welcome open thought and opinion and critique and all of those things um, and, and that people felt comfortable in to, to challenge, to learn, to, to build, to uh, suggest, you know. Um, and so, you know, like there, the idea of the banking system um, really changed my understanding of my role in pretty much everything that I do, you know. It really creates this need for you to listen and that becomes the most important skill that you can have is to sit and to listen to be silent and to create space for that um and to to share that the the possibilities of listening with kids is a little challenging but once they start to understand it it can become really powerful and so you know the kids that we worked with they never left lost lyrics they just kept getting older um, and then they were bringing their younger siblings and the new kids would come and so that's how it grew so it started as this sort of after school program and then it just kept growing for, based on the needs of these increased numbers and these aging children um, and so by the time we were doing the final sort of iteration of the program which was with those original kids but now they were on the cusp of university because they had stayed with us all that way um, the, the, those kids were some of the most amazing listeners and our sessions would be less activity heavy and more just talk based because they were so hungry and understood the value of creating space to engage in dialogue and to learn from each other in that way. Um, that, that final sort of graduate graduation program we called the OGs standing for original griots because it was so much storytelling that was rooted in it. Um, and we would, you know, bring stuff to sort of launch the conversation and to push the conversation in a particular way, but it didn't need to be so activity heavy because they were so, uh, they understood the power and the importance of their voices after all of those years. And they understood the power and the importance of listening to other people's voices as well, too. I love that. I love that so much. Um, and uh, I think that um, 
often there, there is an anxiety. I can speak to this as someone who used to be a classroom teacher that there is an anxiety when um, there's like silence in the classroom because we always feel like students need to be doing, doing. We have to make sure that like, that's our proof that there's some kind of learning happening. And we often take for granted of what's processing when there is no talking and, and that value of, of both listening and being listened to. And, and something that I've learned in my experience with Roots and Wings is this idea of, you know, we, the ways in which um, uh, kids are sort of like conditioned in school to engage in dialogue, it doesn't always, um, translate well to us trying to talk about certain topics because um, it's it can be very sort of regulated about like who talks when ta who who talks for how long and when do you talk and and what when we're trying to work with tough topics or not tough topics but like complex topics related to you know we talk about race a lot we talk about um, resistance and social justice a lot in roots and wings is that idea of sometimes students or kids don't realize um, or don't even understand what it means to be listened to. And so they get really anxious and then they don't talk and they don't know what happens. And so it's completely, completely changed how we do discussion in Roots and Wings and how we frame it. And so it's really neat to hear um, your experiences with that in Lost Lyrics um, because there, it, it's necessarily divergent from the way in which like traditional classrooms are set up in those dynamics. So yeah, that's, that's, that's just neat to hear. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of loop back to something you said in your last answer about how this idea of the banking system has changed many different ways you sort of take up roles in your work. And, you know, as I mentioned um, in your introduction, um, recently, you know, you, your work is, is largely based at the CBC as a host and a writer. And I was curious to hear if you think of yourself as an educator at all in your current role. Or um, you know, what are the ways in which the like your knowledge and your learning regarding education and alternative education has informed the way that you do your work at the CBC? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think the like I said, even the t title of educator was something that we were challenged by. We often instead refer to ourselves as facilitators. We just used educator because the world understood it better, um, but. In terms of being a facilitator, that has been hugely helpful for me to understand my purpose at the CBC. And so um, I didn't go to journalism school. I also didn't go to education, uh, go to teaching college either. But um, I didn't go to journalism school, and I don't see myself as a journalist. I see myself as a person who has access to a platform and wants to share as many stories as I can with the platforms that I have um, and stories that don't often get seen on those platforms or communities that don't often feel recognized or affirmed um, and, uh, and utilize those platforms to also ask important and interrogative questions that might not be the case all the time. Also in the absence of being a journalist, but instead being sort of trained in school as a sociologist. So my master's is in sociology of education and the social, uh, social what did they call the department now? at Oise, it's the social justice. Yeah, it, they it, change it, names all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, broadly social justice and a few other descriptors, but that's yeah, it used to be, I think when I started it was sociology and equity studies and education, anyways, whatever. Social justice education, basically. Um, so th that's where like my academic training has been. And as a result, context is hugely important to me, like the history of why things are the way that they are. And so a lot of the things that I end up writing for the CBC are giving context to current conversations, which day daily news doesn't often get a chance to do. They kind of do the who, what, where, when, and not a lot of the why. Um, and then the why is normally sort of based in, you know, what somebody says, as opposed to the history that led to that particular thing. And I think teaching, I wouldn't describe that as teaching, but teaching really amplified for me the importance of creating context for everybody. You know, once you gave context to kids for why things are the way they are, you just sort of saw their wheels turning. They're like, oh, wait a second. There's, there's a history behind this and there's reasons for why this is the way that it is. And if 
you know, those, those reasons are that it's because of people's actions and decisions that these things exist the way that they do. And that means that other actions and other decisions could potentially change those things. So I, I saw it as a really important and powerful tool to, to create context and to give history to everything. And so I see that as a huge part of my role as a writer um, at the CBC. And then as a host, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a million things. It's like just the importance of being seen as a black woman who wears her hair natural and, or actually wears my hair a bunch of different ways, you know, just being on the television screen um, is important in terms of representation. And I know that that was important for us as educators to the other co-creator of Lost Lyrics is a Tamil woman and to have a black woman and a Tamil woman working together in these communities, leading this organization was really important representation for us as well too. So there are a lot of things that I carry over um, into this job, but um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily describe it as educator. And, and I, I totally get that because um, the word educator, the word teacher and all those sort of associations we have with schooling, um, they, that carries context. And um, I think if, if what we're aiming for is something um, that departs from the way things have always been done, it also makes sense to depart from some of that language if it's not suiting up with I will say though that there, there was one educator that I met who influenced and changed a lot of how I thought about things. His name is Derek Smith. He's based out in Oakland, California, and at the time was the co-director of a school called the June Jordan School for Equity. And he uh, reminded us that the root word of education is educe, which means to bring out, mm -hmm. which is the complete opposite of the banking system, right? It yeah. is, you know, it's not to deposit, it's to bring out. And that we really loved and that we really wanted to explore. And I think it's something that I continue to think about in the work that I do is like, what do you want to bring out? What do you want to, what do you want that has been closed to open up and to, to expose? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's lovely. That's a, that's always a good reminder to to think about. Um, um, we also have the the power to make uh, language work for us and reclaim it in specific ways. So I know we have a lot of pre-service teachers in the audience today, and I I hope that's something that that lands lands um, well in their heart. Um, but I do, I wanna talk about other side of the game. And um, so I, we'll, we'll switch gears and, and we'll talk about the play. And I just wanna say as like a preface to um, everyone in the audience, if you haven't read other side of the game, that's completely okay. I've, I haven't set up my questions in a way that's are really spoiler heavy, but there are some key kind of scenes and moments in the play that I think are really important for us to talk about. Um, as people who want to work with students, as whether you frame yourself as an educator or teacher or facilitator, it's things that I think we need to talk about. And I've sort of zeroed in on two specific scenes that I'll set up for everyone so that we, everyone knows what's going on. But the first uh, scene is scene seven. And um, the, the character that's sort of in focus in this scene is Devante, who's 21 years old recently um, out of jail and hasn't finished high school, but is really interested in um, going back and um, pursuing university and he goes into his old school and talks to a guidance counselor named Miss Flynn and at a certain point in their conversation Miss Flynn says the following to him um, and this is just a quote from the play I just I don't know if this is the right plan for you I don't know if the if it is realistic one excuse me it might be better just to sign up for a GED program and get your diploma and then hear me out look into a trade you can get a lot of good money in the trades and make good, honest living. Have you thought about something like that? And this whole scene, like, really, um, really stuck to my bones when I read it. And then I've read it a few times since. And the character that I, I keep on, like, coming back to and, and thinking about is Miss Flynn and who I think she is and what I think her intentions are. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Amanda, on if you think Ms. Flynn thinks that she's helping in this situation. I, I definitely think she's helping. You know, mm -hmm. sitting in the rehearsals for the first production of the play and watching the director talk to the actors about this particular scene was really uh, informative for me, even though I'd already written it, it was really informative the way he explored the intentions of Ms. Flynn. Um, I was thinking about like in, in writing, I was thinking about certain things, but when he sat and talked with the actors, he talked about the fact that she's bringing up fair points. 
You know, Devonte has been late a bunch of times. He hasn't shown a lot of discipline. Devonte has come into the guidance office asking to, if he can apply to a transitional year program. The transitional year program at U of T is incredibly difficult. I have a few friends that have done it. It requires a lot of discipline um, and commitment. And although it is set up for young people that have been not unable to finish school because of a lot of different life reasons, it doesn't mean that it makes it easy. It's, it's a very intensive program. Um, and so I definitely, you know, the questions that she's asking and the ways she's challenging him, if you brought it, if you just say he tried to appeal it or bring it to like the board, I think they would say that she'd asked, she hadn't asked anything overtly discriminatory. She hadn't been, you know, um, you know, overtly unfair to him at all. On paper, he doesn't look like an ideal person for this particular program. Um, but that doesn't matter. You know, there's there's something else in there. And, and it, it's the subtlety of it all that was interesting to me. Um, and the subtlety of the ways that young people can be pushed out, excluded. It doesn't always look like you're expelled, you're suspended, you are arrested by the police in your school. It's not always this like very clear sort of status of this particular person we are we don't think is, is worthy. Sometimes it's these really small messages that come in of like, I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to think of what's the most realistic thing for you. Um, my husband is one of those people whose guidance counselors told him not to take academic classes and pushed him to go to college instead of university. Even though, and when he got to college, he's like, I'm so bored here. This is not what I want to do. I want to go to university and be, not to say that college is not as challenging, but the particular programs he was pushed into, he, he has that, he was, he's a person that likes theory but he didn't even know he was a person that liked theory until he was he was able to go into university. Um, and he always talks about that. When I graduated from high school, from a high school that has a ton of uh, black, Latino, Portuguese students, there was only one black male that was in our graduating class in a class that in grade nine and 10 had, I don't know, maybe like 70 black males in it, you know? So these are things that, you know, have stayed with me for a long time. And the ways that young black men often and just young black people in general are told what are the possibilities for their lives are not always done in these overtly violent ways. It's often very small, little, little slices. And Miss Flynn, it's funny because when, you know, the, when we were, the play was performed, you could hear the audience just getting so angry, just like, oh, and the anger felt so tense because, because everybody knew what, she, what was, what was going to happen. Everyone knew that he wasn't going to get into the transitional year program. Everyone knew that he was going to give up and everyone knew that the reason for it was because this particular woman didn't want to take a moment to consider that even though on paper, it doesn't look like this kid could do it there might be something in the fact that he is here right now and we can take a chance, you know, and he might just need certain kinds of supports. So yeah, I think Ms. Flynn does think she's doing the most rational, rational and reasonable thing for this particular student. And, you know, bureaucracy often loses a lot of people in following all of the rules and the rationalities of what makes the most sense um, on paper. And um, I think one of the, the reasons why Ms. Flynn keeps striking me as someone I want to get to know more of and more from is, is because you're right, every, everything that she does say is right about the structures that be and the way in which uh, like education is set up. And um, I think something that, that educators or teachers or the pre-service teachers that are in this um, event right now can think about is even if all of those things that she said are true um, the way in which you gauge with a, engage with a human that is in front of you also really matters something else that i didn't say that's in the scene is that she's between files she's answering and picking up phones and that's an entire different program in the ways in which teachers are burdened in themselves but um pausing and having a longer conversation maybe that could have resulted in a different exchange between these two characters. So I think that there's lots to learn from this scene if you are someone who's striving to work within the system of education. Um, 
I do, I want to get to another scene before we, I open it up to a student who will be asking you some of her own questions. Um, and I wanted to talk about scene nine, which is uh, something, so for those of you who don't know, in other side of the game, there are two timelines that take place. One is in sort of like the, the early 2000s, and another one is in the 70s in Toronto, um, but that largely takes place in the headquarters of the movement, which is an activist community organizing space for Black folks. And in scene nine, it's one of those scenes that take place in the 70s. And um, um, there's this, this exchange between two characters, Akila and Beverly, about um, so, sort of what, like, what their hopes are for the space and, and what activist spaces um, have and don't have and the stresses that come with community organizing. And there's a point where Beverly, she stops after Akila talks about all the stresses of like making sure that, that you know, certain folks need to be protected, making sure that, that, you know, how to avoid the police, how to make sure uh, the community stays intact. And Beverly stops and says, what about love? What about the passion, the art? You still need those things. Um, your son needs to know about those things too, right? And first of all, it's a beautiful scene and, and so well written, um, which I thank you for. Um, but what it made me really think about is, you know, how are activist spaces also educational spaces? And then what happens to those spaces when we can't talk about love and art and passion in them? And I was wondering if you wanted to give your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, so much of activism is, is unfortunately based in reactivity. So reacting to the violence that happens constantly in our communities and you know, when you're working from that place of urgency and reactivity and constantly on the go trying to respond to whether it's police violence, whether it's violence in the healthcare system, whether it's sexual assault, like whatever it is, um, sometimes you don't have a lot of opportunity to pause, to recharge, to recognize that we are trying to do more than survive, we're trying to thrive, you know, the sort of saying goes. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote that scene um, after going through a lot of burnout as a community organizer and having spent so much time trying to help people survive and uh, whether it was attending court dates or going to funerals or I don't know, just a bunch of different stuff. And I was starting to forget why, what we were fighting for. So you know what you're fighting against, but you don't really know what you're fighting for. And it's tough, you know, we're like, you talked about at the beginning of this conversation, we're under a constant barrage of violent assault and um, it doesn't have to be close in order for you to feel it. You know, uh, what's going on, you know, south of the border is gonna affect all of us in so many different ways. And then the stuff that happens here is constantly affecting us as well too. And they just, I don't know, I think the question was asked because I was asking the question, you know, where do you fit in all of those things that can kind of feel frivolous when you're fighting for your life, but the life that you're fighting for requires those things to be a full life, you know, you need passion, you need art, you need joy, you need all of those particular things, um, which I think, you know, living a year in a pandemic is only emphasized for all of us that we need all of those things, we need that connectivity. Um, we need that reminder of like why we're here on this earth and why we're alive. So yeah, I mean, I think I think that the the current you know generation of young activists are so much more um, articulate about the like the need for care of self, the need to create balance. Um, you know, even having joy within the protest, having space, you know, for celebration even within the fight. Uh, I think is something that has been a huge learning as a result of a much more, a type of activism that was a lot more dogmatic, you know, decades ago. And uh, that wasn't, didn't recognize how important it was for that, to that space to open up. And I also think that that's the result of leadership shifting from like a centralized male sort of like militant figure leading the movements to what we see now, which is like a decentralized, uh, you know, sort of leadership that is often a collective of people made up of a lot of women and trans folks. Um, and I think that 
you know, the activism that has come out of feminist spaces, out of LGBTQ plus spaces have really pushed for us to recognize our whole selves, not just issues um, and, and how important and urgent that is as well too. So yeah, I, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but I hope it gets to it. No, it's such a beautiful answer. And it, it, um, I was just nodding my head a lot because I've had the privilege of working with a lot of Black student leaders this year with the programming that we've pulled out of other side of the game. And something um, that comes up continuously is their forefronting for the need of spaces for Black joy. And that is something that I worked very hard to try to provide resources so that they could cultivate that. Um, on their own terms, but some, something that, that one student um, said to me um, just in one of our conversations, his name's Joseph and he was on the programming committee. I don't know if Joseph, if you're here, but if you are, hi. And, and he said that one of the most powerful moments that he had was um, a protest that uh, black students uh, put on a few years ago in response to um, in incidents of racism among students and how they filled the streets with like dancing and music and that was the protest and and it made me feel so hungry for those kinds like for for us to to make activist spaces and protests um a space where where we can also just feel really really good about ourselves <laughs> where because elsewhere the world just doesn't allow for it and so i i would agree with you 100 percent that that is something i've learned from, from um, undergraduate students this year, from younger activists, and that I hope that all of us who are older or striving to be in those spaces that, that we care and do those kinds of things and set up those kinds of spaces for our young activists as well. Um, but uh, I'm looking at the time and I wanna bring Michelle on camera. Um, thank you so much for answering my questions, but uh, uh, I want to introduce a student who has been involved in Queens Reads programming this year. Uh, her, her name is Michelle. There you are. Hi, Michelle. And um, to introduce, some of you may know Michelle already. Uh, she may be in your class and, and or you may be close friends, but Michelle um, is a secondary teacher candidate at the Faculty of Education. Um, and your teachables, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but are drama and indigenous studies. And the reason why I invited Michelle to ask Amanda some questions today is because uh, Michelle was a big part of the teaching that we did last October. She played Akila in the scene study that opened our event. And I'm so grateful for everyone who contributed to programming this year. So I wanted to give you the chance, Michelle, to ask Amanda some questions. So um, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, um, thank you. Uh, so my first question, and, and I guess it centers around having played Akila and, and recognizing um, sort of the role of the other side of the game in general and talking about um, Black women and the, the roles and responsibilities they hold and putting them at the center. Um, so my first question is um, looking at the fact that you do explore the labors of being a Black woman in the play. And so I was just wondering if you could tell us more about how Black women are perceived, uh, but specifically about the amount of work and burdens that um, we are expected to be able to handle and whether you think there's a difference between those expectations that like we as black women hold for ourselves versus um, those that are held by others. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's a there's a few different stereotypes that black women have to contend with that are historically rooted, whether it's, you know, the stereotype of the mammy, the desexualized older black woman who is just there to care, nurture and provide support for everybody else, but never for herself or um, the Jezebel, the highly hypersexualized black woman who is just there to give pleasure. Um, there are so many, the Sapphire, all these different ones that um, a lot of them come out of uh, slavery and, and the ways that slavery was justified. And, um, and then the one that everybody shares all in total is that black women can work. They can work hard, they are super women. They have the capacity to work beyond everybody else. And, and again, that was used to justify slavery. It's like, oh, these people are tired. They can keep going. They can keep on going. And you know, living in a capitalist society where just the the allure of work is just on everybody, and this idea that we all need to grind so hard, sleep when you're dead, keep on going, grind harder and harder, that only gets amplified when you already have this historical stereotype of black women being the hardest workers, the mules of the world, as Zora Neale Hurston spoke of it. 
in turn, so that's the world and how we are seen by the world in terms of our own perceptions of self. It's weird to speak in these generalized terms, but I do think a lot of black women have also internalized this belief that we are, we have to constantly work hard to, to be recognized as valuable to society, as valuable to our families. Um, I know for myself that for, I've, <laughs> it's rare that I am not doing three or four or five jobs at a time constantly and I tell myself it's because I just love to work hard and I love to grind but I also think that it's because I've been taught that my value is intrinsically connected to this idea of, of working hard constantly and pushing yourself and I um before we started the session publicly I disclosed I have a baby four months old and this baby um was conceived during the first time in my life that I ever stopped working so uh other than childhood um so in the first two weeks of the lockdown none of my employers or nobody that i was working for knew what to do they were like oh my god there's a pandemic we have no idea what to do um and so I, all work was paused and of course this horrible thing was happening in the world but for two maybe three weeks i was i had nothing to do i was so relaxed and it wasn't like vacation relaxed it was like i'm at home and everything is put on pause. There's nothing ongoing. There's no emails to check. The emails aren't even coming in. Um, and in the, it was in those weeks that my baby was conceived <laughs> because I was the most relaxed that I've ever been. Um, and it was really scary too, because I realized that, you know, we've been trying to have, sorry, this is maybe TMI, but we've been trying to have a baby and we hadn't been. And I realized maybe we hadn't been in part because I was so wound up from work that my body wouldn't let me and it was only when I relaxed so I think there's a lot of dangers there um when you look at a lot of the illnesses that black women uh rate highest in a lot of them have to do with stress they're stress related they're you know the stress of the body there are so many studies that show you know the biological makeup of of black folks and the fact that our cells we might be like 29 years old but our cells are this this sort of cells of a 45 year old because of the amount of stress and work that we do um, I wrote a little bit about that in my latest, sorry, not to plug, but in the play that I wrote called The Death News, because I'm just fascinated by this. So the way that the world has been set up to, to create a space for Black death before its time, premature Black death feels like an inevitability. Um, so anyways, I'm babbling. But yeah, I think that we uh, we are definitely set up to work way too hard. Thank you for that. I, I never even knew about that side of it, the biological um, aspect and that it's having a toll on us um, in that sense either. Because I, I, I think of it from the mental health standpoint, I think noting, obviously seeing the labors and things that my generationally people put up and no one ever complaining, like everyone noting at this point, because I'm more aware of my mental health, that like my mom puts up too much work and she deserves a break, but knowing that no one has taken a break before. so. I find that in the black community, especially like amongst other women, that they just all continue to put up with it because no one's ever said that they were tired. Yeah. And so it seems like our threshold is just out of this world when really like, and me, and then and then the issue with that is, and it's interesting because in the play, um, the person who does tell Akila to take a break is another black woman versus the men going on and saying, well, she can do everything. Like she's never complained before. She can't be tired. And I thought that was very, very telling because I find that I notice more black women telling you that you shouldn't be tired because even though they've needed a break, no one has started that, that route of taking it. And so they're like, I don't know why you think you deserve a break. Like I've done more. And there's this like competition aspect. I think it's also a generational thing to a certain degree because uh, I, as you were talking, I was reminded of my grandmother. She went on the cruise for the first time ever like five years ago or something and I remember asking her how it was and she's like oh my god it was the most amazing thing I woke up I went to get she's like I woke up and I took my shower when I came back my bed was made up and she's just like no one's ever made my bed before and there was food already made like no one's ever cooked for me in that way before and you know my grandfather sometimes cooks and obviously her kids cook here and there but she's talking about something different like everything's already set up you don't even need to think about it and to, and to just hear her say like, she's never, she never experienced housekeeping before and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, she'd just been working and working and grinding and grinding. I did include that it was another black woman that asked that question of care because I find that in our generation or 
you are probably younger than me, so in this gener this younger generation, um, the question of care, I feel like Black women are, are checking in with each other a little more. This, uh, there's a, a, a recognition that we need to check for each other a little bit more. And although there's still the things that you discussed, like competition and all of that sort of stuff, there's something around this idea of self-care, of uh, recognizing that we need to cultivate that for ourselves and recognizing that in our sisterhood, in this black girl magicness, you know, as romantic as it sounds, there needs to be something in there that makes sure that we check for each other and make sure that we don't grind ourselves into the into the into the ground. So um, yeah, I, I think that I know in my life the people that have checked in on me the most have been women. Um, and I'm I'm very appreciative of that. So I wanted to reflect a little bit of that in your life. Awesome. Um, okay, so another question I have is and, and this is me, obviously, as an education student. Um, but how do you think that um, educators, and, and I guess you use the word facilitators as well, so facilitators, um, should go about doing identity-based work in racialized and other marginalized spaces? That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, I, I always think about the standpoint theory, which is that you is, you know, it comes out of women's studies and it's the idea that there's no such thing as an objective space. Everybody comes from somewhere. And so I think starting from where you come from first, recognizing all the privileges that you may have, all of the uh, blinders that you may have, all the things that have shaped who you are and the gaps that, that exist there. Starting from that place, I think is always the most powerful because as long as you come to young people honestly and openly and just recognize and letting them know like this is who I am and where I come from it's not going to be the exact same place as you I can't make assumptions about you and so I would love for you to come and let me know where you're coming from is a really um is a really important place to start from um and then you know in terms of this type of work I feel like you just have to constantly be creative you know you have to constantly be you like there's no um, set plan. Every group of young people is different, the culture, the environment, the energy, all that sort of stuff. And so you have to constantly be willing to reinvent yourself. I always say that um, my job as a facilitator had made me a better host slash performer because you are constantly on as an educator, right? You're constant, like the classroom in some the students in some ways can you can see them as an audience and if they're yawning and if they're bored you got to switch up your performance and make sure you figure out something else and as a host it's a really good thing to know because if i'm doing something on stage or if i'm on camera and it's not flowing very well i can feel it on from the crew i can feel it from the audience i'm like oh that just reminds me of little ishmael at 11 years old being like miss i'm bored man like switch this up so anyway i um I, I'd say start from you know where you are and who you are and then go from there and then just constantly be open to being creative, keep, keeping yourself on your toes and and um, and being responsive to to the people that you're serving. Awesome. No, I love that. That and it, it just makes me think of like keeping relationships at the center because I guess that's that's generally how they're built too. And I found I'm um, working with with people who have difficulties trusting adults or just building relationships in general because you know if, the stuff that has happened in their communities that that's that's how you get them to open up they just they got to trust you and be like okay i know who you are like i trust that you're being honest with me so yeah and i will i i'm not going to act like that's an easy job to do especially given the context of what teaching looks like right now which is virtual and like how you know challenging it is with huge classrooms that so many teachers are faced with it's it's an uphill battle and so i don't think that this work is easy at all and i'm sitting here in the sort of privileged space of my bedroom be like start a relationship, check in with them, explain where you are in your standpoint. Um, so I, I know that this work isn't easy and kudos to everybody who is teaching right now because I know that it's super difficult. Awesome. Okay, so my last question kind of comes based out of um, an assignment that I was able to do for one of my courses. We, we each get to pick, at least in the Queen's faculty, um, a specialization and mine is specifically social justice education. Um, with Dr. Lee Ayrton and, and we got to do this assignment where you were creating a lesson plan um, and you were creating one for a group that you like connect to in some aspect of your social position and then one that's like the opposite and I decided I was using the other side of the game and I wanted to explore the, the labors of being a black woman and, and connect with black students um, and then my opposite was actually black male students 
um, because right, I can't I can't necessarily connect with that um, that aspect, but there's still something that's going on there. So my question um, is about how to engage black males using the other side of the game as a learning tool specifically, because I found that at least I find that arts is a great learning tool in general. I, that's why I'm in drama as well. Um, but I think it's very interesting to be able to teach from that side because the way that you pose the relationships between um, black males and black females uh, in the in the play, there's a connection there, but there's also some things that are making it difficult as well. So I just wonder how you, maybe if there's any ideas that you have about using the play specifically as a learning tool for black males. And then um, in general, just engaging black and racialized males in the arts. Yeah, I mean, I think using the arts to engage young people in general is just always a great idea. It's, it's definitely the tool that I leaned most heavily on when I was, you know, in the classroom. Um, I hope my play will be a good one too. <laughs> but yeah, I think that, you know, I don't, in terms of specific ways to engage young black men with this particular work, I feel like, you know, the, the impetus for creating it was in part based on this idea that like, when you turn on the TV and you see something that has to do with um, the prison or crime, they're normally following two folks. It's either they're following the perpetrator of the crime. So like, you know, the police will come, they'll barge in the door and they'll arrest a person and you either follow the person they arrested or you follow the police who's doing the investigation. The person you never follow is the woman, the girlfriend, the mother, whoever, who is left at home and has to deal with the door that they just broke into, the chest of drawers that they just threw over and the fact that the, the person that they care about now has to be posted, has to have bail posted maybe the next day or whatever. And so I was interested in following that trajectory. And so introducing it like that to young people has always been very effective because they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I get that. I've, I've seen, you know, Law and Order or I've watched the wire or whatever. And like all of those things are male dominated, but we don't get to see this other side of it. And so it's kind of like a chance for them to peek behind the curtain of this the experience and be like, oh, what's going on on the, uh, literally the other side of the game and see what's happening there. Sorry, that's so corny. <laughs> but, um, and, and, then, and then it allows, you know, us to have a, an, an interesting conversation because now we're looking at it from this perspective, but their perspective is still a part of the whole experience. So when it comes to, for example, the relationship between Khalil and Akila or Khalil and Beverly, um, engaging them in the idea of the difference of power dynamics and, and the things that Khalil sees and does not see and the ways that Khalil is, um, is also in a part of the oppression that he is trying to fight, you know? And, and, and he's a part of creating an, an oppressive space engaging them in the character of Devante. Devante feels for a lot of young people very familiar, somebody that they know, somebody that they recognize. What are the ways that Devante is trying to change? What are the ways that he is um, stuck playing into the stereotypes that people assume that he is going to be in? Um, I think is, 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 is an interesting way to start the conversation with young men about the play. Um, and then, I, I said it in another talk that we did for Queen's Reads, but uh, music was a huge part of helping me to write this play. And I think that connecting the themes of the play to music uh, of right now, or even of the past to hip hop, a lot of hip hop was a, was a huge inspiration, um, I think is, is also always a useful way to engage young people in this as well too, because these stories have been talked about by musicians and by artists of all kinds for, for so long, um, but maybe just from a bit of a different perspective. Um, awesome, yeah, that's that's so insightful. Thank you so much. I yeah, when I was doing the assignment, I, I think when I was trying to think of how I'd engage them, I was focusing on um, using it as a way for them to reflect on uh, masculinity and black masculinity and the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was really I, but I like I, I love the insight you have about using that and and using it as a tool. I think to learn more about their relationship to black women as well because that is yeah the play is about centering those those voices and those experiences because they're often not as you said so yeah thank you so much um i i anyone who hasn't read it like i would push it through i read it in like one sitting i like couldn't stop reading it so it's a great read oh thank you very much Thank you so much, Michelle, for, for taking the time to be here and ask your wonderful ask your wonderful questions. Um, 
like I said, the programming for Queens Reads this year only exists because of the students that have worked with me, Michelle, yourself included. Um, I want to preemptively apologize to the audience because I completely forgot about the Q&A portion of our event, but I want to get to, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Kaju, um, as maybe the last question we tackle for today, because I think it's it's an important and one that, that um, builds off of Michelle's question. So I like the way you say that Black women feel the heaviness of their burden, feeling older than their actual age. Do you think that Black girls are more expected to act mature physically and emotionally in their teenage um, years comparing to white girls? How can you compare the responsibility on an equity perspective? Did you have any thoughts on that, Amanda? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it changes depending on where you are and, you know, geography and, and certain things. But I think, you know, where I am in Toronto, I think that there definitely is a culture where not only are Black girls expected to act more maturely, they're just perceived more maturely. So uh, the world perceives them as older than they are as, you know, and I think that's actually true of black girls and boys to a certain degree. Um, it's, sorry, I'm like, I, I have a four month old and everywhere I go, everyone thinks that he, he's a big boy. He's like a chunky little baby. And everywhere I go, people keep thinking he's older than he is and expect him to be able to do things that he can't do yet. And I'm so weirded out already by it. I don't want to project too much into these perceptions, but I'm just like, no, he's, he's only four months. He's an infant guys, like leave him, you know? And so anyway, sorry, that was just like your, your question triggered that, um, that personal reflection. But I do think that the world often puts this expectation on black girls, um, whether it's that they're starting to see them as sexual earlier on, or whether it's that they're ex seeing them as, as, as adults in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, in terms of an equity perspective, I think creating space for black girls to just be girls, to be children for as long as possible, to play, to, to you know, I think is really important. Um, when we were working in communities like Jane and Finch and Malvern, a lot of the kids that we were, that were coming into our spaces had a lot of responsibility in their lives. You know, whether it was that they were older siblings to younger siblings, their parents were working a lot of hours, you know, they, they had full schedules where they had to do a lot of different things. Um, uh, whether it was like picking up their younger sibling from daycare or, you know, clean, cleaning up, getting snacks ready, different little things. And they, they had a lot going on in their lives. And so Lost Lyrics became a space, in, like an importantly, a part of the Lost Lyrics space was just to play, just to like let go of all of that. Bring your younger sibling, go watch them too. Like you can let go of that expectation and you can play and you can be silly and you can you know make loud noises and, and you can do all of those things because maybe right now there isn't a lot of room for you to have access to that and to be that silly and to to be that immature self um so i i wish i i would that's a great question though I, I wish i could give it a little bit more thought i'm not sure if i'm answering it in the best way but those are the things that come to mind immediately no, I, I for myself think that it's it's very insightful and, and as someone who also does sort of like out of the classroom education with BIPOC um, youth, uh, that that aspect of silliness has become very like important to me personally and how I choose to facilitate um, myself around not just the kids but also with the undergrads and um, I'm looking at the time and I do just want to say again, I apologize to the audience for not leaving enough time for more questions, but I will say that we were very, very blessed to have Amanda for an author talk last month in which we had a very uh, longer conversation. And so if you're interested in, in learning more and hearing from Amanda, I'm going to link to the YouTube channel before we depart. Actually, I think I might do that now before I lose you all. But um, I also wanted to just take a couple of minutes um, to say that this is the last Queen's Reads event for the year. And um, I, I just really wanted to express my gratitude to Amanda for trusting us with your work. I've said this before, but I have to say it again. Um, I've ha been felt so privileged to work with the students that I've worked with this year to pull out the conversations that we've had this year that I think have been important for us university wide and just create 
um, some spaces that maybe didn't exist before for Black students. And that was all because um, your work inspired myself as well as all the other students who worked um, with me. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for all your work. Um, thank you uh, for working with us and thank you to everyone who's been involved this year. I hope that um, everyone who's participated in the ways that they have uh, take this as um, not the end of whatever journey that you have towards resistance and solidarity work. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> let's, let's keep doing it and let's keep loving ourselves and each other in the ways that we know how. Um, so thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm not sure if there are any last words you wanted to share with the group. I just wanted to say thank you specifically to you, Clarissa, for being such an incredible person to work with, being so patient with me <laughs> during this entire process and for uh, all of the different ways that you've worked with so many folks to, to make this work accessible and engage with so many folks. Thank you to everyone who's read the play, who's picked up the play, who's gifted the play, who's engaged the play. I'm very grateful. Um, I, when I wrote it, I had no conception that it would, you know, travel in this way. And I didn't even know what a Queen's Reads was. So I'm very, very thankful that it was selected. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to all of you for, for showing up and, and for engaging in this conversation. My kid is screaming downstairs. I'm going to go right now. But yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, teething, it's hard when you're that little. It's painful. It hurts. I get it. Um, <laughs> so I will let you go. And to all the registrants, I will send a bunch of links your way after this event so that you can watch the videos. You can download your ebook. Um, it is available to us until the end of the year. So you're more than welcome to to play along and, and read up if you haven't had the chance to. Thank you, Amanda. I hope that you have a great afternoon and that your little one feels better soon. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye, everyone.